Good morning, buenos días. Vamos a, a darle la bienvenida a Osama, que, que nos va a dar la primera presentación del, del evento. Les damos la bienvenida al Oracle Community Tour online. Lamentablemente este año tampoco lo pudimos hacer en presencial, pero esperamos que ya en el 2023 podamos hacer un evento en las ciudades de Latinoamérica, como regularmente lo veníamos haciendo. Sin embargo, bueno, pues en el 2023 seguimos con esta modalidad en línea. Yo soy Rolando Carrasco, soy parte de la coordinación de los grupos de usuarios en Latinoamérica basado en México y vamos a dar por eh, inicio, vamos a dar la, el inicio, perdón, de, de nuestro evento con la primera sesión con Osama. Osama, thank you very much. Thank you for joining us and thank you for your support. And you, you may start your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, and welcome, guys, uh, to the American Latin Orca Tour. Today, I'm going to be speaking, actually, about how to automate, like, let's say, a repetitive task using uh, DevOps tools. But before this, actually, we're going to learn about DevOps, what is the benefits of the DevOps, and what kind of tools I need to use, actually, and what a uh, kind of mechanism uh, for tools I need to use. Uh, before this, let me talk about myself a little bit. Okay, like the founder and CEO for Guru Solution Company, the leader and director for Jordan and Melo Region Group, uh, Oracle is director, as well different certified Oracle provider. Uh, I like to automate things as well. Uh, I started the database, but now I'm working also with the different databases. Plus Oracle and author for two books, contributor and in Oracle community, and also blogger on my like blogging. This is the two book actually, like quick, uh, both related to the security actually, and now working on the third one that's related to the cloud. Uh, so let's do. First, about the agenda, what I need to know, like for this session. First of all, you need to understand like what is the DevOps and when I need to use it, what is the benefits of the DevOps and why I need to use it. Uh, also, like as a DBA, what the benefits of the DevOps for me? Like most of the DBA thinks that I don't need to know like anything about the uh, DevOps or it's not my criteria and so on. You are wrong, we're going to change this concept actually in this session and we're going to learn actually more why it's needed to learn at least actually one tool that is going to be allowed to work with DevOps. I'm going to give you a little bit of examples, actually a real life one that's done by automation to show you how actually uh, make it much easier for you as a DBA to implement the solution using the automation tools. Uh, finally, we're going to go through the question in case you have anyone, anything. Uh, you need to understand, like, what is the DevOps? DevOps, it's referred, like, for development and operation. The idea itself came actually to fill the gap between this kind of department. It's enterprise software development that used to agile relationship, and we're going to talk about the agile later on in this presentation between the development and the IT operation. So technically the idea of the DevOps is to change uh, the mentality of these two departments and improve the relationship and the communication between these two departments. For example, let me give you an example about this. Uh, before the DevOps, okay, like when, for example, the development team need to request, for example, a server okay for new deployment or testing or whatever uh, the process usually gonna go the guy or the developer gonna go to the infrastructure team the infrastructure team gonna ask for the email and the email gonna go to the approval after this the infrastructure gonna start creating actually in, uh, the server with desired operating system either windows or linux or whatever uh, then you need to like to install like some of the tools on the server and so on, which is usually going to take time, probably like one, two days, depending on the workload for the infrastructure. Uh, DevOps is going to cover, OK, 
okay it's not only about the automation for this what we are talking about as an example it's only like gonna help you to carry the communication between the two teams and cover the gap between two teams and to cover also as well most of the guy think that the box it's a new concept it's very old concept actually it started by uh, 1957 the idea came actually with the first written code okay and after that uh, like as a move to 2003 we will actually hire someone called Ben which is was responsible for the production environment and these days it's called SRE engineer uh, to run like stability of uh, production environment and to make sure everything is running fine separated from the development environment without like any conflict in each of these environments and like usually the team is responsible for maintaining like 99.9 percent .9 actually for, for the production environment especially like for google and so on uh when after that in 2009 uh, like a new let's say a new company which is called the flicker i think most of us know the company they campaign the dev and the operation team into one team called uh, DevOps. Uh, the guy who mentioned this, it was called Don, I think, or something like this, who is create this, and he wants to do something actually like extra for the community. So he scheduled like a meetup for the DevOps, and he started like tweeting about this. So what had the hashtag was? It was DevOps. So that's how the DevOps actually created. From since that, actually, the DevOps start like trending uh, in the community and start trending in the world. Uh, the category, like the category for the DevOps, it's a huge. So we are talking about the DevOps. We are talking about different uh, category. We will talk about each one of them and what kind of category you need to understand and you need to learn more. Uh, usually you're gonna see this graph actually a lot when you are talking about DevOps. Uh, as you can see, there are a task for Dev, <coughs> sorry, for Dev operation, and there's a task for operation team. The Dev task usually uh, resides, for example, in uh, coding, build, and test, and the operation usually deploy, operate, and monitor. But there are intersection between these four to team, which is planning and release. Okay, so. DevOps is like, as mentioned before, it's enterprise software development that allows you, for example, to apply the agile methodology inside the company and uh, fit up communication and cooperation between these two business units. And mentioned also before, a traditional model, Dev, um, for example, development and iteration work, uh, usually 100% in independent and different from each other and you're gonna see actually a lot of fight between both of the business units and in most cases like one team late for the visibility and the other one actually throw the task on the other one and so on so like the project can take like ages to be done so with this one when we are talking about with devops mythology or account mythology you are attending to be cross-functional with both of the team so you can depend on one team for example to do all the tasks you depend on the both team and both of them actually gonna have visibility for each other okay to implement the solution so it's gonna help uh, reduce the cost the risk and the timeline for the project itself so in general when i'm gonna use devops you need to understand that i'm using devops for different things the first thing I'm using DevOps, which is to speed the deployment process. And when I'm talking about the deployment process, for example, uh, when we need to deploy something with a production, usually the traditional way, you're going to take like day or you're going to define a day during the weekend or probably out of working hours and implement the solution. And you need to do like the rule packet plan in case something happened and so on. Uh, also, like, organization usually spend too much time with the manual process for example for testing deploying and so on so with devops you can also automate like 
this task, for example, instead of keep doing them manually. Also, like enable fast response. When you are working with DevOps, you are focused a section of the DevOps or like a rule. Job rule has been uh, also involved with the, which is SRE that responsible for the production monitor and uh, enhance for the infrastructure. And when I'm talking about enhancement, that include uh, infrastructure, automation, and uh, deploy new things and upgrade new things. So when you automate things, the team that you're going to have inside the company can, will have more time to focus on, for example, like uh, new things, like let's say uh, upgrading the new software or probably uh, involve a new technology in the infrastructure and so on. And when you also deploy or automate things, you reduce the human interaction with your infrastructure because with the automation, you've done it only once and that's it. You, you write the code for the automation or you configure the tools, do the automation things for you and that's it. After this, everything can be automated for you. You will not touch probably the tools only in case you do, do do some enhancement and that's it or probably you find out after one year uh, there are a better way or something to do also uh, another benefit which is imagine you are working with the project okay usually with the traditional model you work with a project as once like infrastructure with the deployment with everything so all at once which is make the project actually huge for the for, for the person, for the engineer. With the DevOps law, you divide the project to different like soils, such as, for example, the infrastructure. And even the, inside the infrastructure, you divide the project into the different level, the development as well, and so on. So you don't have to work for the project as one. No, you work for the project, for example, for a different uh, sections, which is give you even motivation, for example, like, oh, I complete this section, I, I did this section and speed the process for the company as well so they see the results for sure the project is like as one oh, sorry. Uh, like the next one which is when we are talking about devops we talk about the agile both of them are connected but each one of them is focused on different things devops like focus on the technical stuff uh, agile focus on the project management stuff but both are connected for example like agile focus for example on the mythology that gonna run the devops for example like such as for example probably in most of the company now like stand-up meetings retro and these kind of things uh the board for campaign board uh, uh, and, and, and these like this con considered as a giant mythology uh with the devops you are focused actually on, on the technical stuff okay you are focused for example how the operation and the development you know work with each other uh, the tools itself for example like what kind of tools i'm going to use like infrastructure as tools i'm going to use configuration tools for authorization and so on and you're going to architect so it's technically a technical part not a project management with agile you are focused on communication between the two Teams. You are not focused on the technical stuff with the teams. Uh, you are focused also like on the delivery. And as I mentioned, like uh, delivery, for example, visibility uh, in front of all the team, like uh, traditional mo uh, mythology or model. Usually, for example, if you have five engineers inside the team, probably each one of them, for example, don't know what the other is working on. So with the uh, agile mythology, you have standard, you have campaign. So it's clearly actually what you are working on and what kind of issue that you are facing. So probably you're going to get help from the other one in the team member and so on. Now let's talk about like DevOps with Oracle. Like why you need to use like DevOps with Oracle? As a DBA, okay, you need to move on with the old mentality and you need to learn something new. So DevOps, it's going to actually automate things for you that it's used to be as a manual. For example, we're going to talk about a lot of the examples, such as a great databases, batching, and so on. If you're going to have 100, or let's say not 100, it's too much. If, like, you're going to have five servers. 
on the production and you need actually to upgrade the database on them. Usually you're gonna go on like one by one, one by one by one. With the automation, I'm gonna show you for example how it's done but with, with the automation part, uh, patching even for the database. Like if you're gonna as we, we all know the patching actually should be done frequently. So imagine if you're gonna do it frequently in a manual way for a couple of servers, it's gonna be a important task after a while. Uh, creation for the users, permission, and these kind of things. All of this actually is considered as a manual. You can automate them and save time for yourself. Uh, so, when I'm going to talk about like DevOps with Oracle, I'm talking about like uh, automate the manual work. I'm also automating like uh, the pouring task, let's say. I'm also like going to like the automation scripts that I'm gonna wrote is gonna be useful for the other people as well in the company. <coughs> and as well, like the most important thing when you are doing things manually, like the risk error, it's too high. With the automation, you've done it manually. you done it, test it, it's working. Okay, I'm gonna use it like in different environment. That's why. And especially if uh, you're gonna make everything as a variable not static so you don't have to change in the code every time you need to deploy something we have a different category for the devops each one of these category is focused on different things for example like we have the first one which is infrastructure as code we have configuration management we have uh, uh, Interization, and we have uh, as well the uh, CI/CD category. With the infrastructure as code, in this one, like with the manual way, let's take the manual way to allow you to understand what is the infrastructure as code. With the manual way, usually when you need to build the infrastructure, you have to to build the networking, uh, the operating system, the VMs, and so on. With the infrastructure as code, it's from the name. You build everything as a code at first, and then you deploy it, and you can use it actually in different environment, which is going to save a lot of time for you as well. One of the fa most famous example in this one, which is Terraform. Terraform is considered one of the best tools for infrastructure as uh, code, but it's used for the cloud, not on-prem. If I need to use something on-prem, I need to use Ansible as well which is also Ansible allow you to work on a cloud and on a prem as well. The community for both super strong, so and both of them are very simple tools actually to learn. Uh, the difference actually between them that the Terraform actually it's like a tool that bundling, changing and virgin as well the infrastructure. And it can be also managed the existing and popular services, for example, in case you have a different services in the cloud and you need to use them inside your code for the Terraform, you can use this inside the, the Terraform. And Sebel, on the other on the other hand, it's like open source as well, and it's allow you, like for example, to deploy on on a prem or to deploy in the cloud, and you writing custom uh, code for yourself. Uh, and this is actually our topic for today, which is. The tools that we're going to focus on which is Ansible. There are different tools that allow you to do this such as Shift, Soft, Stack, Puppet and these tools are not open source and they are very complicated so you need to know exactly like you need to be expert actually especially with Shift for example and Puppet. There are a lot of scripting in these, uh, in these two tools. Uh, Circuit CI which is uh, for example, another example of CI/CD, Circuit CI, Jenkins, the most famous one. Uh, when the when the developer need to deploy new code, okay, like usually you need to take downtime approval for the downtime, and you need to upload the code, test the code. Okay, it's working up and running. Okay, that's the manual way. But with these kind of tools, no, the the developer, for example, change the code upload the code to the virgin control, the virgin control such as uh, GitHub, GitLab, uh, the bucket, uh, these kind of things. Uh, it will, uh, the developer gonna create something from pull request. Okay, the pull request need approval after review from one team member manually. It's gonna approve, make a comment in case the code probably need fix or something. 
or need enhancement. After this, once approval, it's going to be deployed automatically. So we don't have actually to do anything, just to only approve. And that, that's the only thing that needs to be done from your side. Uh, and there are like Jenkins, which is the most famous tools for this one, Circle CI, Team City, and so on. Shift even can work as a Circle CI as well, uh, Puppet as well. Uh, uh, Jenkins, it's like also considered one of the free and open source automation server that built for CICD. So it's automated the parts of the software related for bundling, testing, deploying, and continuous integration, continuous delivery, and so on. Uh, Puppet as like general uh, configuration management tool that ensure, for example, all the server and configure to there, for example. And what define what tools I need to use, it's depend on the architecture that been set by the company. So we don't have to like specific, for example, I need to use Chef for everything, or I need to use Jenkins for, for example, it's depending on the company. Some of the company, for example, they choose to use, not to choose to use like open source, so they pay extra actually to use a different tools and so on. Uh, to understand, for example, we say like uh, Ansible uh, Terraform, which is technically working as, uh, as like the same. Uh, Terraform, for example, agent, this is working without agent, Ansible as well, but uh, Terraform is focused on infrastructure as code, which is admin focus, Ansible is focused on the admin focus, plus focus on the configuration management, so you can use it for both. Jenkins CICD tools, it's agent list, no need for the agents or anything. It's helping to deploy the code on your environment, production, development, QA, or whatever. Puppet, ship, it's like agent, so you need to download agent on the server or on the client, and it's most focused on the dev part. You can use them as an admin, but most of the people are using them as a dev. Uh, so it's also very famous, for, but it's not like open source, so you need to know this. It's focus also, it can be work as agent or agentless. It depends on the architecture again, and it can be focused on the admin and the work as well. These are a general, like there are a tons of tools. Not only this, but this is like the most famous tools in DevOps, actually. Uh, one of them, for example, Terraform, Ansible, and Jenkins. You're going to hear... You're gonna work with DevOps. You're gonna hear a lot of, uh, about these tools. Uh, any questions so far? Now, when we are talking about like a part of the DBA job, we are talking about like. A large portion, for example, like configuration the operating system, install the Oracle database software, creation for the database, configuration for the database, update the database, batching the database, take care of the backup, uh, and so on. Uh, when I notice all of these tasks, and to be honest, after a while, like three months, four months, it became boring to keep repeating the same task over and over and over. Therefore, I start looking actually for something to automate these kind of tasks, and I reach to Ansible, which is be able to completely automate the boring task from, for myself, work agent list, so no need for extra configuration, or I don't need to care about the agent in case it's done or something happened to the agent. And as well, it's like very easy to use. So all you have to do actually is know about the indication, how to write it, the keyword, and that's it. Then uh, it's very easy to use. How Ansible it work? Like, as you can see from the graph, Ansible, you have like, for example, the master server, which is Ansible node, okay? And you inside this server, you have two concepts, which is the playbook and the inventory. The inventory, it's located under the, uh, ATC Ansible host, which is different from the operating system host. This host, it's defined the group of the server that you have inside it. So it's totally different from the operating system one. You need to understand this. Uh, and it's connected, for example, to operating system for the Linux using the SSH. For the Windows, it's connected using a different protocol, I think RDB or something like that. 
okay uh, and you can use like ssh as well like but this uh, gonna be it's a work from you uh, the ansible inventory it's like let's say a file that define for example the host and the group of the host like for which comments and the models and the task in the playbook and the playbook we're gonna talk about it but, uh, after this uh, so you can understand more about the playbook and the concept of the playbook as I mentioned, the inventory location, it's ATC and civil host, it's different from the operating system one. It defines the server and the group of the server that you have. For example, uh, a group A assumes that I'm having three database servers, so I create database group for database. I have, for example, five for the web server, I create five uh, group for the web server. Uh, what the benefits of this? For example, I need to restart the database server. In instead, for example, of go one by one to each one of these servers, I just call the group and that's it. The five for the web server, I just call the group for the web server. So I didn't have to worry, for example, about uh, to call them one by one. Uh, the playbook, it's like configuration, Ansible configuration deployment. And it's written by Liam, so uh, as I mentioned, and it's technically described the policy that you want what has been Ansible need to do for yourself or for the server, for example, either for enforcing uh, steps and what has to be done actually from the Ansible side to the server as well. But as a basic level, let's say Playbook can be used to manage the configuration and deployment to the remote machine. Uh, and the more advanced level, they can, for example, sequence multi-tier for rollout, rolling update, and can delegate, for example, action and other hosts interacting, for example, with the monitor, server, and load balancer even. And as I mentioned, it's written by Liam, which is, for example, a shortcut for yet another multiple language. It's very easy tools to use. It's like the only thing that you need to know is the indication. That's uh, the only thing. One of, like, let's say, uh, facts about Ansible, it's agentless, so which you don't have to care about installing anything to the remote server or to the agent. It's working using SSH. You need to configure the password list, and that's it. Uh, another concept you're going to hear, which is facts. Facts Ansible usually, when you're going to run playbook against your remote server, Ansible going to run something in the background, okay, to collect something called facts. Facts, it's like scripts run in the background that you know allow the Ansible to understand the IP of this machine, the hard disk, the devices, and so on. And these it's save actually inside the Ansible master node. And it will be useful, for example, in case you're going to write a playbook for yourself. So instead of writing a custom configuration to, to know the IP, all you have to do, for example, is call the facts to collect this information. And there are two kind of playbook you need to understand. The first one, which is called ad hoc, and it's a predefined one. So you don't have to write anything. You don't have to customize anything. For example, I need to create a operating system user. It's already predefined by Ansible. I need, for example, to run one of the comments. It's uh, predefined. I need, for example, to create server on the cloud. It's already predefined. I need to delete something, it's already predefined. How to know these kind of, uh, it's, it's defined or not, from the documentation. The other one, which is the customization, which is playbook, okay? Play, like, uh, the playbook or the customization playbook, such as I need to do something on the server, but the ad hook is not exist. For example, I need to patch one of my database servers. For sure, you're not going to find actually a predefined module for this, so you need to write your own predefined module to use Ansible for this. Uh, this is called the Playbook, which is a set of rules, exactly, uh, allow Ansible to understand what it's going to do. And I'm going to give you a real case example, actually, of uh, using Playbook. An installation of Ansible is pretty simple, actually, it's working on most of the operating system. You can install it like uh, 
first of all, on Red Hat, you can use on Ubuntu, you can use uh, using Python as well. Uh, you can install the source itself from the GitHub and deploy it and so on. But you need to understand so far that to work with Ansible, you need to configure the SSH uh, password list for the SSH. So that allow Ansible master to communicate with uh, the remote. Let's start, for example, with the ad hook. The ad hook, which is, as I mentioned, it's like already predefined module. So you don't have to worry to write them. You don't have to worry to customize them or anything. And simple, written these, uh, these comments for you. And you can just call them and use them. How to know them, for example, from the documentation. The syntax to do this, it's very simple. It's simple. You minus them, for example, calling the module and the option for this module. Uh, these, for example, like predefined <coughs> example of the module, such as you can see copy. Uh, for example, like you can manage the library, you can create EC2 in AWS, you can create, for example, a virtual machine on Azure, you can create a front tab, and there is tons of pre modules, so you need to, to check them from the documentation. An example. I need to reboot, for example, a server, web server. And let's assume, for example, the group of the web server contains 10 server. Okay. What I need to do to reboot this is just, for example, because I'm using ad hoc, which is predefined, that's all I have to do. It's sensible. Web server, which is my group, and minus a, which is for action, and when the comment. Over here, it's going to run the reboot command on the group of the web server that contains 10 servers. So I don't have to go one by one actually to reboot the server. All I have to do is just mention the module and that's it. Other one, for example, predefined the module, I need to copy the file. For example, imagine you are installing databases and you need to copy, for example, like the software to five or six servers. Uh, you don't have to do it manually. To go to the server one by one and so on all you have to do for example upload the file to the ansible master and for example ansible the group that you need to copy minus m which is the module copy where the file is and the destination and it's going to copy the file for you or it probably create user and the group for example in case you need to create a user for the rack or something like this all you have to do also as well it's called the ansible the playbook uh, predefined ad hoc for example which is ansible i define a group called all uh, i need to create like a user for all my server the name of the user for example as you can see the password and i set the password over here so the user gonna be uh, created on all my servers as well. Now let's go to the fine part or the hard part for uh, Ansible, which is playbook. The playbook, as I mentioned, it's like include four modules. The first module, which is five, and usually uh, it's used to create a home for our, for example, uh, for the installation that you need to do. The second one, which is uh, the second step, and the third one, and the fourth one, and the fifth one, depend on over here. To make it simple for you, as you can see, this is, for example, example of playbook that I have written, which is to install a Golden Gate in your server. Okay, it has four modules. The first one, which is used to create a home directory for the Golden Gate installation. The second module, which is gonna unzip, the Golden Gate installation into specific directory. The third one, which is going to create a variable. This variable I can use for the next module, which is the last one. And going to allow me, for example, to execute the Oracle Run installer, actually, and install the Golden Gate inside the server. As you can see over here, it's all written in the end file. I over here, uh, the name, for example, the first stage, and what the first stage can do. The second one, for example, which is unzip the Golden Gate, what it will do and what user gonna be responsible for this. And the, the, 
the last one, which is the, the installation, which is going to use actually the silent installation for the golden gate, which using the response file and so on. Another example as well, which is installation for the database actually using Ansible. Uh, what I did for this one, I defined inside the inventory over here, ATC Ansible host. I defined the server one for the database server one, and I defined the server two, and I define all the database server, which is one and two. And then you can solve the database in these two servers. What I did actually, I defined, for example, over here, the structure of the folder, as you can see, I am going to install using the response file. I wrote the, also the template, the YAM file, and so on. And it's going to be using uh, Red Hat 7, I, yeah, Oracle uh, Linux 7, actually, um, which is need to be installed and simple on Python. Uh, the managed server, as you can see over here, I have server 1, server 2. Uh, as well, uh, the same information actually updated in the host, as you can see over here, using the, uh, this kind. To install the software, I need to verify actually the step of the create, like the master playbook in our case, actually, which is a uh, database over here, as you can see over here, the YAML file. It's going to be responsible to install actually the database as well, collect the information, target, unzip, the same as the golden gate. But for this one, I'm going to like use the response file, which is the second one. In this one, I'm going to use it. The same as you're going to do using with, for example, when you're going to use a response file with your installation. But this time, I'll use it actually inside the Python, inside the Ansible. So you can create like response file. OK, by copy the response file from the Oracle form and modify as required, depending on the variable that you have. Okay, and also like you sorry. Uh, also, for example, in the traditional installation, you will enter, for example, all the fields such as the Oracle Base, the Oracle Home inside the Ansible Playbook. Once you're gonna run the Playbook, actually, the installation will start for your databases. As you can see over here, this is like a define of the playbook. I'm gonna like define there are a couple of steps. The first one gonna display the pre database software installation message. Okay, then I'm gonna create the required directory for the database and then I'm gonna uh, copy from the master to the database server that I needed. And after that, I'm going to start installing, uh, install the database. All of these examples actually can be found on my GitHub. Uh, so it's already actually uploaded over there, which is going to be useful actually to use. This is the most error that I face actually during writing the playbook, which is related to the Python. As you can see, it's required over here. This is the error, which is required JSON module. And this is related because I did not install the Python simple GC for this one. Once you're going to install it, the error is going to be solved. This is in Ghana case, you're going to use this playbook. Now, let's take more complex example, actually, which is upgrading the database. If you're going to upgrade the database using the manual way, you have like the pre upgrade step, you have upgrade step, and you have the final step. Uh, what I did, I did this step actually, but using the Ansible playbook itself. So I defined playbook for the pre upgrade, which is contained in the front step. Once it's finished, this one going to call the upgrade one, and the upgrade going to start upgrading the database. Once it's, this one is finished, it's going to call the final one. Each one of them having a different, for example, Step the pre upgrade, for example, no downtime if the database in archive mode. It's gonna check and it's gonna run 24 hours before the plan for the upgrade. Run pre upgrade uh, script and it perform, for example, the full backup and run uh, the fix uh, script for the database. After it will be finished, it's gonna run the upgrade. The upgrade is required downtime, it's gonna perform incremental 
backup and it's gonna be enabled the flash database and create a restore point for this and run the manual database upgrade and take another packet after the upgrade. The final one, which is no downtime as well of the database in the archive. So it's gonna like run seven days after the upgrade to finalize, delete every restore point that you have and then take the back for the database. All of this is automated, okay, and it's already uploaded to my GitHub, so you can actually review the code from the, uh, the GitHub itself. Now let's talk about Ansible and the cloud. Like, you can use Ansible as well to create, for example, servers in the cloud, not only on, on the prem or to automate things. You can also, for example, use Ansible to create OCI. Uh, services because Ansible include a couple of pre module defined which is you don't have to write anything in you so such as the servers uh, storage compute object storage databases all of these is predefined so you can launch a computer instance you can set up autonomous databases you can list an object you can delete an object you can also there are a playbook predefined one which is for the volume, for the Kubernetes, for the, the storage itself, for the AIM, for the load balancing, for the networking. It's very like mandatory to review the documentation to see anything before you're gonna write. Or waste your time to write anything actually. And even if you're gonna go to this link over here, it's like from Oracle Corporation itself, you're gonna find a lot of playbook predefined playbooks so you can download them and modify them depending on what they need for example in case you need to create for example autonomous database in the cloud you can use actually this predefined module to do that it's going to generate for example ssh key for you it's going to specific the public key and it's going to be like demonstrate the launch for uh, the instance itself Uh, the next one, for example, the predefined one, which is set up the autonomous database. Also, there are a predefined module for that one, which is going to like down uh, create one. It's going to allow you to stop the database. It's going to allow you to delete the database as well. All of this is predefined for Ansible. You can also like use the same module to delete the database, for example, in case. Uh, this is the link as well. It's from for Oracle GitHub uh, repo. Uh, found and you can also like I'm gonna share with you my uh, account for the GitHub so you can download the custom one as well. Delete object so in case like you create like delete object for example created for example within the last ten days, you can also use Ansible predefined module to delete this packet for example that has been created so you don't have to rewrite something in you. All you have to do is just download it, modify it depending on what you need, and then run the playbook depending on what you need. And it's very easy to understand actually because the variable, everything is like a uh, poly mean, and it's very easy to understand. Now, let's talk about one of the most famous actually tools as well, which is Terraform. Uh, if you are in new, infrastructure as code as a concept it's like the process of managing infrastructure in the files or files rather than manual configuration resource in a user interface so for example a resource in this instance in any piece of the infrastructure environment virtual machine security group networking interface and so on can be managed using the infrastructure as well therefore you know, allow you to iterate for example to use the configuration language to author these files containing the definition and working with different cloud providers such as OCI, AWS, GCP, uh, GitHub, Docker, uh, Helm, or whatever, and automate the creation for these resources at the time of life. Uh, while, let's say, for example, many of the current offering infrastructure as code may work in the environment, Terraform, the good about it is the community. It's very powerful community. And it's working, for example, platform uh, database, for example, like it's working with different cloud provider. And it says a lot of the provider can be downloaded, such as, for example, Helm, uh, 
فور اكزامبل دوكر جيت لاب اند ذيس كايند اوف ثينج ستيت مانجمنت وين يو ار كرييتنج ذيس از لايك يو نيد تو اندرستاند ذيس وين يو ار كرييتنج انفراستراكشر از كود يو نيد تو اندرستاند ذات يو ار كرييتنج سمثينج كولد ستيت فايل سو ان كيس يو نيد تو ديستروي ذا انفراستراكشر هاو ذا تيرافورم اور اني اذر تولز جينا اندرستاند فور اكزامبل وات هاز بين بيلد يوزنج ذيس تولز It's to create something called state file. This state file is very important. So usually the company, they save this file, or not in the local. They save it probably on the bucket or in the cloud itself. And they are enabled the version for this bucket just in case something happened. And like the last one, which is greater confidence, for example. Like the waterflow built inside the Terraform aim to install the confidence for the user because it's very easy to use by either, for example, like allow the user to ensure the action taken by the Terraform, for example, will not cause uh, any error to the environment, or for example, like when you apply, it will be promote, for example, what has been done and it's allowed to review what has been done. Terraform can be installed on it, any platform. You can also, this is my GitHub, as you can see over here from the corner, the right one. Uh, you can see all the examples that are related to the Terraform, to the Ansible as well, inside the GitHub. You can install it and enjoy the information. Uh, so, for example, if you are new to the infrastructure as code, well, these projects actually going to allow you to understand the infrastructure because it's called from scratch, it's allowed to understand what has been done, how to provision these kind of the cloud with the instruction to do that, not only like just to deploy these infrastructure. Terraform comments, it's very simple. The first one, which is Terraform in it, which is allow you to install the provider that has been used by you when you are writing your files. The second one, which is a plan, Okay, that allow you to understand what kind of resource, okay, that will be deployed in the cloud apply, which is going to apply these plan that have you seen in the cloud. And if you set auto approve, it will not ask you to, uh, to answer yes and destroy and destroy force, for example, to destroy all the resource. As you can see, destroy is going to depend on the state file of the Terraform, which is over here that I mentioned in the second point. If this file has been deleted, Terraform is going to generate an error and tell you it cannot find any resource. So you need to be careful for this state file. You like the definition of the Terraform file. The first one, which is variable. In this file, usually I define all the variables that I need, such as, for example, the region that I need, the cloud provider that I'm going to use, uh, the access key private key, or for example, like uh, probably more, for example, like the region, the cluster name, or the, uh, the virtual machine name, and so on. It's anything variable, changeable. You define it in, inside this file. You can define everything in one file, but for like management-wise, okay, you can just separate them. The variable one, it's only for the variable. Right? going to be defined the value that going to be configured using the infrastructure and probably going to be changeable. The output, for example, it's optional. You can use this file or not. Actually, it's like when you create the server and you need the output for the ID for the server. So you can use actually this file to uh, return the value of the Terraform, for example, for the IP or for what kind of uh, uh, has been created. For, you, for the user. So it's useful as an output for the user. As you can see over here from the example, it's telling you, for example, the resource has been applied and it gives you the IP of the server as well. Data source, for example, I mentioned that you can use Terraform, for example, existing resource that already built, not using Terraform in the cloud. Okay, inside the Terraform. How to use this? We need to use the data source. The data source allows you to use, for example, to call this uh, services, for example, that already built and created on the cloud and call it, for example, inside your code. For example, I create a server manually and I need to use this server somehow, for example, inside my code. 
Okay, so I call it using the data source instead of recreating a new one and set up a new one for extra code. So this is like the best practice of the file, as you can see. The file structure usually it's defined. Uh, the main, the variable, the output, and the telephone. The main, which is considered like uh, calling all the variable and all the output that has been defined for you and so on. I'm going to give you an example. Now, for example, the main, as you can see over here, I, I'm going to create like a single web server on AWS or Microsoft or whatever. It's even on whatever you need. But I'm going to deploy it for, in this example, on AWS. I will create a security group. This security group, as you can see, uh, it's having ingress. And I defined the uh, port as a variable. Uh, it's going to be like having. Then I'm going to deploy this server. What kind of operating system I'm going to use? What kind of security group I'm going to use that has been created over here? And for sure, like what kind of the data I need to invoke inside this virtual machine using the user data over here. This is inside the main. The output is going to be send me the IP of the server and the variable, as you can see, it's the server port that has been used over here. And the main, as you can, var dot server port and var dot server port, as you can see over here, which is variable and server port. So anything is defined as var dot, it's like variable inside the telephone. This is like good example in case you need, for example, more question or more, for example, about the Terraform. Back to my GitHub, there are like a basic examples that allow you to start actually with the Terraform as a good start. Read me file for each one of the repo that allow you to understand how to deploy it, how to modify the code depending on your need. There are examples for the OCI, for AWS, for Microsoft, so in case you need to learn which cloud like provide one that's your favorite as well any question i think no osama uh, i see some comments but just thinking in case guys you need anything this is my contact for example the twitter my blog and the link in as well so in case you need like or you have any question or you need to learn something more actually just let me know. I see some comments about the, the content was very good. So thank you. Thank you for your support on this event. We appreciate it. Thank you guys for attending right. the session. And in case you have any question, as I mentioned, you can contact me using Twitter or on my blog or my LinkedIn. Uh, Ronald, I think I'm going to send you the presentation in case somebody actually need it. Yes. As well. Okay. All right. Thank, Thank you, Zama. Thank you all. All right. Thank you. Gracias a todos por su participación y en 10 minutos empezamos la siguiente sesión. Gracias. Thank you, Sam, again. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.